So, um, the industrial urgency is, the, as, as it was said, uh, the title of a book I've written in French. It is, it is not an uh, academic book. It's a book uh, addressed to, um, to people who have an interest on in the city. Uh, how uh, should a, a nation work? Is it uh, important to have an industrial basis or not? Uh, can we consider that uh, some problems, important problems we have, uh, for example, unemployment, have to do, uh, uh, have a relation with uh, weakness of the industry? These are the questions uh, I'm dealing with. Uh, and um, uh, the general idea, I, I think you will see that, is that we need uh, a new uh, industrial basis in order to develop a new uh, development model. This is very important. It's not just industry, it's industry within a new development model. It's uh, for me uh, very, very uh, important. And this model uh, has to be uh, implemented by the um, citoyen? citizens. citizens, by the citizens. Uh, it shouldn't be left uh, only uh, to the political parties. Uh, or uh, to experts, uh, I think uh, that this uh, new uh, development model uh, should be uh, democratically uh, prepared, uh, thought, and even uh, put in uh, reality. Uh, I would like to, to stress this point, it's very important. So, industrial urgency. I will, of course, uh, try to be uh, within the 40 minutes you, you gave me. So the presentation, presentation plan, in three parts. The first part, um, even if I have no time for that, uh, I will try to, to emphasize the idea uh, that the industry is extremely important. Uh, the second point is to try to understand what are the reasons, and not the reason, the reasons, there are a lot of them, uh, they uh, all together uh, make a sort of system or they are convergent and produce industrial decline. And the third point is the component of industrial contracts uh, because as I said, it's a contract. Uh, it's a contract and this contract is a social contract. And this social contract is a heart, the heart, the heart of a new development model as I said just before. So I hope it's clear. So the, the first point, the place of the industry, is, I would say, better recognized today. I work on, on this topic, industry, industrial development, industrial dynamics, as uh, Danny said, industrial policies, since uh, I was uh, around your, 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 your age. So it's uh, <laughs> a bit time. Uh, I've written a lot of articles, uh, books, uh, of course I will not mention them. I've prepared my two thesis on this uh, topic, comparing uh, Germany uh, and, uh, and France in Europe about competitiveness, industrial policies and so on. But I s as I uh, began, uh, the idea uh, that uh, uh, industry is important for the future was absolutely marginal. Uh, probably uh, extreme marginal among the economists. Uh, the, the idea was and it's still today that a developed country is a service country. Uh, the, the idea is, uh, and you, you know that uh, of course, uh, uh, the idea is uh, coming from a lot of economists, but Colin Clark, you, you know him uh, for sure. Uh, in France, uh, Jean Forestier, the, so not another economist, they have pop uh, popularized the idea that when a, uh, a country develops, then it has uh, to uh, go through different uh, stages. The first stage is agriculture, primary sector. And then, uh, after a, a couple <laughs> of uh, uh, centuries, then the industry uh, has to take the hand. And then, of course, of course, the industry has to left uh, this, uh, this place to the 
third uh, sector to the uh, services sector. So the idea is that a modern country, a developed country, uh, is strong when its services are strong. This, this idea is uh, very popular and in the mind of a lot of people, I think that most people think that uh, a developed country uh, has to have a, a strong service sector and it's not so important to have uh, an industrial uh, basis. So we discover, and I would say uh, more or less first empirically, that uh, this um, conception is wrong. Uh, what we may see, uh, it's not very clear, it's, it's red, in, you, you may read this, uh, even it's red, yeah? uh, that um, there is no developed country uh, uh, which may uh, remain developed or there is no developing countries, as for example uh, China, but I, I could uh, uh, take other examples, uh, who are able to develop without developing uh, their industrial basis. Uh, and uh, I could uh, talk about uh, China, I could talk about a, a lot of countries, I could even take uh, contra examples, uh, as for example uh, the United States of America, or France uh, to demonstrate empirically uh, that uh, develop development and industry are uh, very strongly linked. So this is very uh, important. Uh, if you take the facts and not uh, just ideas or representations, I would say, then we can measure that uh, even today in a country as France, uh, I have tried to measure uh, what is the weight of the industry. And of course you cannot uh, measure uh, the weight of the industry according to all employment uh, because uh, you have a lot of employment uh, which is not um, uh, marketable, uh, for example in public administration. So the, the right basis to, 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 to make comparisons or to measure the part of the industry uh, is to take the market sector. If you just take, if you just take the market uh, sector, then uh, you see that direct and indirect, indirect industrial jobs, I mean in services linked to industry, uh, they, rep they represent 45% of the total employment in the market sector. So it's rather difficult to, to assess today, that to say that uh, industrial or uh, uh, industry linked services are not so important, you see. I if we just take this indicator, and this indicator is not the better one, 45% uh, of total uh, employment in the market sector. If you take the exportations, uh, if you take R&D, then you have, of course, rates uh, which are uh, much higher than employment. So you see, the idea that industry is marginal is empirically absolutely wrong. Um, okay, if you see that, uh, what is the problem? Uh, the problem is that in almost all countries, uh, at least in Europe, and with a gross, uh, very important exception, Germany, uh, you see that uh, the uh, industrial basis is becoming weaker. This is absolutely true and this is not a new phenomenon. It's a phenomenon which uh, goes back, I would say, around 30 years ago. So it's not a, a, a very um, quick uh, decline or a decline in the last two or three years. It's a very long run uh, time uh, decline. And uh, we may see, uh, even today, that the uh, losses in industrial jobs and uh, plants uh, becomes uh, uh, becomes higher um, without any any doubt. Um, this this point uh, could be seen as a sectoral problem. I don't see that as a sectoral problem. I see that as a political problem, as a social problem, but too as a macroeconomic uh, problem. I have not a lot of time to develop this point, but I have made some calculations. Uh, if I take, for example, France, uh, if in France we would have just an equilibrium uh, between industrial importations and industrial exportations, so no deficit, but 
no accidents too. So just equilibrium, importations are equal to exportations. We would have every year 3% more gross domestic product. You can imagine what it means, 3%. It's, of course, a lot. It's a lot. It means a lot of employment and it means uh, higher revenues and tax revenues and, of course, uh, shrimping uh, public uh, deficit. So the macroeconomic effects of uh, the industrial declines uh, are today very uh, visible. Are very, uh, you, can, you can say that. You, you can measure that in the macroeconomic, macroeconomic uh, statistics. So I move to the second part now. Uh, if you want, we could back, uh, we can come back to the first point afterwards. Uh, what are the reasons of uh, the uh, industrial decline? Uh, there are a lot of reasons. I will say just a word about uh, some of these reasons. But the, the idea I, you, I would like uh, very much you to understand is uh, that all these reasons are convergent. They converge. They produce a sort of system. Uh, so there is no single solution to go out of the industrial decline. This is very important because uh, some people say well, we just have to, to have higher taxes important uh, importation or uh, to reduce uh, labor cost and if you do that we will solve the problem it's not uh, it's not correct at all because you have a lot of reasons explaining explaining this industrial decline so uh, these reasons uh, produce a sort of system of reasons uh, and to go out of this uh, decline we will have to have a, a systematic policy uh, there is no one reason it it should be uh, just uh, uh, put on the on the play and it works it, it doesn't work like that so what are the reasons uh, frequently uh, given a bad specialization, I agree with that, uh, especially for, fr for uh, countries as France, but uh, I could say the same for a lot of countries, price sensible. Uh, you see, for example, now the euro rate to the dollar or to yen or yuan, it doesn't uh, matter, uh, is rather high. And the, the consequence of that is, is uh, very clear. The exportations go, go, go down. They go down because they are price sensible, price elastic. Eh? You understand what I, what I mean with that? Eh? OK. Too high cost. Uh, here, when I say cost, it doesn't mean uh, only or especially labor costs. All types of cost, uh, they, they can be too high. And uh, if they are too high, of course, the price competitiveness uh, goes down. Overestimation of the euro is it goes together with bad specialization. Too small place of uh, small and medium sized uh, enterprises. Uh, this reason is very often emphasized, but I think this is uh, this has to be explained. And, and in my opinion, the fourth, first, the fourth point, the too small place of the SMEs, has a strong relation with bad relation between big enterprises and their suppliers. But uh, I could stress this point afterwards if you like. Tropism on services, I'll just uh, talk about that. And high technologies. Uh, this is uh, uh, very French and very American too. Uh, sort of tropism on high technologies. Uh, the idea is uh, that uh, uh, if you are very good uh, in, in, in aircraft uh, industry or, or in biotech or uh, in very high-tech industries, th then everything will go okay. Uh, this idea is absolutely wrong. It's absolutely wrong. If you take, for example, uh, Germany uh, in Europe, Germany is rather weak uh, in high uh, technologies. The Germans are very strong in medium tech and not high tech uh, uh, industries, but they produce high added value products. Uh, this is not the same. Uh, this is not the same to say high technology, high added value. This is, uh, this, uh, uh, both uh, uh, proposals are absolutely different. You, you may have uh, medium tech industry, for example, car industry or uh, chemical industries or machi machiner machinery industry. Uh, these are medium tech industries, but with very uh, high added value products. This is, uh, these two points should not be confused. And uh, uh, for, uh, perhaps the last 
frequently given uh, reason, too low growth. Uh, this is rather important. I will go back on this point. Uh, it uh, it uh, concerns uh, mainly the big firms. Uh, big firms are very mobile and they are looking for a market dynamic. And when a country or a region has a too low uh, growth rate, these firms invest uh, in other uh, countries, other regions in the world. But acting like that, of course, they reinforce uh, the, the growth, the too low uh, growth, because their investments are not done uh, in their home market, but are done uh, outwards. You, you understand, I hope, what, what I mean. Right? So it's, it's a sort of uh, uh, cercle vicieux. Mm -hmm. Vicious circle. Vicious circle. <laughs> okay, it's uh, easy. So these these uh, reasons are uh, in the literature uh, very often mentioned. Uh, more or less, I agree with that. Uh, but this is not uh, um, necessarily the only reasons, and I would like to stress uh, three uh, other reasons. Uh, in short, uh, I will just mention them and go back uh, to them. The first reason is the extravation uh, and then the financialization of big groups. This is a, a very uh, important explanation, in my opinion, for deindustrialization and inefficient industrial policy. Uh, here we could talk uh, uh, just for the whole afternoon about the industrial policy, of course, uh, and an outdated conception of work. These uh, three reasons are less mentioned, very much less mentioned in the, in the literature, and uh, I would like to, to stress them in short. So, um, if we consider the big groups, uh, of course they are very important in a country as France. The big groups represent around 75% uh, of the um, industrial production, so you see uh, uh, they are extremely important. Uh, what we can see uh, is that the fate, you understand the word fate, uh, the destiny if you prefer, uh, the fate of uh, global groups appears not to be any more uh, linked with that of the national industrial basis. Uh, more or less, it, it, we, could, we could say the industrial groups, uh, they, they, they live their own life and this life has uh, uh, nothing to do or very little to do uh, with uh, the industrial uh, basis of a country. Uh, uh, as at first, as I understood that, it was true for Great Britain. It was true for Great Britain in the 80s, as I saw uh, that the uh, industrial basis in Great Britain was uh, year after year decri decreasing and declining, but on the other hand, uh, the wealth of uh, a very big industrial uh, British uh, 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 firms uh, was extremely, uh, was absolutely perfect with very high profits uh, and uh, uh, dividends paid to the, uh, to the owners. Uh, it was true for England in the 80s, but not true for France and not true for Germany, not true for America and, and so on. Today, uh, I would say that the only country uh, you can see a strong link between the fate of the groups uh, and the fate of the industry is Germany. It's absolutely clear, uh, German firms uh, and uh, the industrial German basis are extremely linked, but this is absolutely not true anymore for French firms and it's absolutely not true for American firms. Uh, and in, in, in his own uh, 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 tweets, uh, uh, Trump uh, uh, says that because he says uh, he wants to have a strong uh, uh, industry, for, for example, in automotive sector in, uh, in, um, in America. Uh, but he knows very well uh, that uh, the firms, the American firms, as General Motors, for example, but not only General Motors, have delocalized uh, in Mexico uh, so that the industry, uh, the automotive industry in America, uh, I'm talking about North America, United States, is today rather weak. Meanwhile, uh, the, these uh, firms, the firms of the automotive industry, 
are expanding are expanding in Mexico, not in not in uh, United States. So you see uh, that really uh, this is an example among a lot of uh, examples that the fate of the groups are not similar uh, to the fate of the industrial countries. This is very important to to to, to get that. Huh? Um, and uh, I've tried, of course, to measure that, uh, to, to, to have an estimation about that. Uh, and uh, you just have to look at the investments. Uh, and uh, the investments are more important in the long run uh, than those made in their home country. And if you take the, the first 40 uh, large firms in France, they invest today around 80%, 80% uh, outside uh, of France and less than 20% in, in France. And you see, and if you do that uh, for over 20 years, uh, the question is, uh, what is your nationality? Uh, is, are these firms still French firms? What does it mean? And uh, of course, I have to look uh, on the capital structure of these groups. And this ca the capital structure of this group is very open to global uh, investors. Huh? I, I could talk about uh, this point uh, along and uh, Danny uh, as well. Well, um, another point. Uh, uh, the industrial policy, there is a lot to say about industrial policies. Uh, as I told you, I've written a lot of things about the industrial policy. I, I just would like to stress one point here, just one. The idea uh, is that the uh, industrial policy has been very long, too long, and even today, very centered on individual groups. Uh, it means if we want to help the uh, uh, the uh, the uh, I don't know the automotive industry in France, then uh, what what will uh, do the state? It will help Peugeot, uh, Renault, uh, or uh, Citroën. And uh, if you want to help, uh, I don't know, any sector, then you just pick up uh, what we call the national uh, champions, which are n not anymore uh, national, as I've tried to explain, and uh, hope uh, that helping them, uh, they will uh, push uh, the whole uh, industry. This is absolutely wrong, in my opinion. This is absolutely wrong, even if the fate of this group would coincide with the fate of the industrial uh, basis, what's, what is not uh, the case, as I said. Why? And this is very important for me now. Why? Because the industry is not a simple sum of enterprises, is not a simple sum of sectors. Industry is probably is the most important message, in my opinion, I would like you to understand this afternoon, is that the industry is a system. Industry is a system, it is not a simple addition of firms or a simple addition of uh, uh, sectors. And if you agree with that, to say that industry is a system, then the elementary unit of a system is not a single actor. The elementary, elementary unit of a system is uh, the relationship between two, two actors. This is the, uh, the elementary unit. I hope you understand what I mean now. Eh? It means if you want to help the industry as a system, then you should cut uh, all helps, all uh, subsidies uh, to individual firms and push uh, uh, the entities of the system to cooperate. It means you push projects, you push networks, you push uh, firms to work together, firms to work with, uh, with uh, universities or with uh, research laboratories and so on. Then you act, of course, uh, by strengthening uh, the industry as a system because you help densify the system. This is uh, the, the main point, you help densify. And what's important is not how much firms you have, what is important is not the concentration, what's important is the density. The density is uh, made by the relationships between the actors. So the industrial policy has been a very long time not doing that, that at all. The, the industrial policy has been helping uh, individual firms, individual groups uh, to strengthen them, to avoid that they close or things like that. But it didn't see the industry as a system. Uh, I hope uh, that uh, uh, it was clear what uh, I tried to, to, to say. Well, the last point, uh, and it will be the beginning of the third part of my uh, contribution here, 
is uh, uh, an outdated conception of work. And this is, in my opinion, extremely important. Uh, when we talk about uh, work, about labor, it is, it is today, even today, it's incredible for me, considered as a cost. Uh, as a cost, and is, if it is seen as a cost, then a cost should be reduced. And this is uh, uh, extremely important. Eh? And work, labor, is not considered as uh, a contribution of individual and collective uh, skills. When we talk about competitiveness, uh, mostly competitiveness is understood as price competitiveness. And if you understand competitiveness as a price competitiveness, then you will see, of course, uh, the labor as a cost to be reduced. And we will talk about cost cost competitiveness, price competitiveness, and just forget what is very important, that competitiveness is a global concept and not a concept that should be reduced on prices and costs. And it means to be precise that you have to have a competitiveness strategy centered on innovation. And here is the question, how can you have a competitiveness strategy centered on innovation if you remain by a representation presenting labor as a cost to be, to be reduced. Who innovates? Who innovates in the firm? Of course, people innovate, people working. If you just consider people working as a cost to be reduced, then you cannot wait for them to be innovating. Innovating is absolutely impossible, it's a paradox. Uh, and this, I think, is, is very important. Eh? This, this point is, uh, again, a very important uh, message. So I move now to the last part of my presentation. Is the components of a productive pact, as I told you, it's a pact. It's not a, uh, a thing uh, which has to be left to experts or even to uh, political people. It's a productive pact to be uh, thought, to be uh, realized uh, among the, the citizens, about the, the society, civil, civil society, I would say. Well, um, my idea is uh, that European countries must engage in uh, productive activities development program. This is very important. Uh, this is uh, the, the main point. Uh, I had the luck or the bad luck, I don't know, to be very much engaged in Greece uh, uh, with the left uh, uh, government for two years long. Uh, I could talk a lot uh, about this point. And uh, uh, what was for me very clear at the first beginning well, of this experience was the problem of Greece is not the debt. The debt is a result. The debt is a result, the debt is not a problem. If you see the debt as a financial problem, then you will try to, to, you will try to find some solution to, the, to this uh, problem by reducing uh, the interest rates or things like that. But you don't solve the, the problem itself, the problem which is, which is generating the debt. And what is gener generating the debt? Th this is uh, the uh, economic basis which is too weak. Uh, if you take a country as Greece, uh, perhaps you know that, uh, that uh, Greece is not so much uh, export dependent, but import dependent. It means uh, that as a lot of countries, and we could say perhaps that for France too, the problem is that the Greek demands uh, looks not for the n n national uh, production, the Greek demands goes to the importations. So if you increase a little bit the demand, then you have a disaster because the, the national product system is not able to respond uh, to, to the demand. So uh, a lot of economists are focused about exportations, exportation, exportations, but the main problem for a lot of countries is not uh, the, the, the exportations are not, not strong enough. The problem is the important dependency. So, and I would say for European countries, uh, especially for France, but not only, that they uh, have to uh, reinforce the industrial basis in order to respond uh, to, um, to, the, uh, to the needs, to the national uh, needs. So what are uh, the uh, components of this uh, pact I suggest? 
the first component, I think you will not be surprised if you understood what I said just before, is that we have to have another way uh, to think about competitiveness. What is competitiveness? Competitiveness is not mainly a price and a cost problem. Uh, it's an overall competitiveness, and this uh, overall competitiveness is today strongly linked uh, with innovation and in order to push uh, innovation the only way is to recognize uh, all people working as uh, cognitive workers it means workers uh, using not their labor force this is not the problem is uh, people working and using their their brain using their creativity uh, using their intellectual uh, 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 fitness and uh, things like that so of course we, we could uh, develop this point, which is uh, very important. Another point, these are around eight, nine points. Very quick, but uh, last year, as, uh, as I was here, there was a great discussion about this point. The question is, uh, how uh, would it be possible to, um, to bring finance to serve productive activities, and not the contrary, and not the contrary. Today, the productive activities uh, serve the finance. And the idea is to inverse uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, relation. Uh, and the question is, of course, uh, how to do that? Uh, how are we able uh, to, to, uh, to have a finance uh, serving productive, activity, productive activities and not productive activities serving the finance. The answer, but perhaps in the discussion I, I will develop a bit this point, is to um, insert temporal uh, retardance. The problem, the very problem today is uh, that finance is not liquid. We need uh, uh, liquidity. We need a, a liquid finance because we need a finance financing investments. So this liquidity is absolutely necessary. But you should not confuse liquidity and volatility. It's not at all, not at all the same thing. And today, finance is not liquid, finance is volatile. And volatile means that finance cannot finance investments because investments need time. When, when a firm invests, the return on investment is at least three years is around, I would say, three years, four, four years, five years, but not immediately. It's, impo it's impossible, absolutely impossible. Okay, so uh, the only way is, as I said, uh, to, to have uh, uh, a mobile uh, finance or liquid finance and not volatile. And in order to shift from a volatile finance to a liquid finance, the only way, there is no other way, logically, is to bring uh, inside the financial wor world temporal retardance. Uh, perhaps I will stress this point afterwards if you wish so. The third point is that action uh, should be uh, reoriented to address basic needs. And here I am speaking about basic needs, I am not speaking about consumption. Uh, the, the idea is that even in rich countries, as uh, uh, France, uh, Germany or uh, developed countries, uh, the basic needs are today uh, not satisfied. Uh, if you uh, just have a look uh, by housing, how the people live, in what sort of uh, houses uh, they, they live, uh, what is about health, what is about education, what is it about energy, transportation and so on. The idea is that you cannot say that basic needs are uh, overall covered. It's not true. Even in a country as France, you have around 20-25% of, of people who may be declared as poor people, even with these people, uh, do have work. So uh, here, I think a very important is to reorient uh, the production to address not a higher consumption, but to address uh, basic needs. And this has to be done, it is very difficult, this has to be done by reducing the burden of productive activities in the nature. So you have to, to, to produce a sort of double reorientation, uh, in one way responding uh, to basic needs, in the other way simultaneously 
by reducing uh, the uh, burden of productive activities on, on the nature. In order to do that, you need absolutely uh, uh, cognitive workers. Uh, if I take for, uh, and just an example, um, uh, if you take, for example, uh, bio-agriculture, then bio-agriculture is, I think, a good example because it addresses a basic need, good food for good health, and on the same time, bio-agriculture bio reduces the burden of uh, productive activities on the nature. It's, I think it's clear. But how is it possible to develop bio-agriculture? Can you do that with uh, people having no idea uh, 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 except following the procedures of Monsanto? This is the question. Eh? I think it's impossible. Uh, you need people working in the agriculture with uh, uh, very high standards, uh, understanding the cycles of seasons, knowing how is it possible to implement uh, the, 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 the earth without destroying it uh, with uh, pesticide, uh, herbicide, uh, uh, and so on. So, so you need high skilled people so, to, 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 to do that. Huh? Uh, another point here, and this is a very important debate, uh, and these debates occur today in France. You will hear a lot of that if you follow a little bit the French uh, actuality. Uh, is the firm should be recognized as a separate institution with the society. Uh, I think a lot of students do not understand very well this point because uh, they think uh, that uh, uh, the enterprise and the society is the same. It's not the same. The society belongs uh, to the shareholders. If you organize uh, the board of uh, the society, you will find uh, the people representing the shareholders and just only the shareholders. And here I'm talking about uh, the society. I'm not talking about the enterprise. The enterprise is something else, and this else should be as an institution recognized separately with uh, the society. The only country really doing that in, by, developing by developed countries is Germany. Germany has two bodies. One body is society, and this society has a board. The board represents the shareholders. And it has, it exists another institution. The institution has for name the enterprise, the firm if you prefer. And this uh, enterprise, this institution, has a board. The board, I don't know it's called, how to call it in French even, Betriebsrat. Uh, it's, it's another body. It's not uh, the, uh, uh, comment? Comment? The wor no, it's not the, the workers, because uh, in, this, uh, in this council, 50% uh, uh, are uh, shareholders' uh, represent representatives, and the other 50% are representing uh, people working in the firm. So 50-50. And there is always a dialogue, sometimes very difficult, between the board of the society and the council of the enterprise. Do you understand the, 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 this point? It's extremely important huh? not to confuse the society, the shareholders, with the enterprise, and the enterprise has to have its own uh, uh, managing uh, council, uh, and this council should be min um, uh, at least composed by representatives, representatives of the shareholders and representatives of the workers. You could even open uh, this council to other bodies, um, but what is important is to have separating governing bodies uh, of the corporates. Do, do you understand what, uh, what I'm trying to, to explain? If it's not clear, I will come back to this point. There it will be uh, very interesting to follow the, the discussion uh, taking place in France in the next, uh, in the next weeks. Come on. Eight minutes. Eight minutes. Five minutes or eight, eight minutes. minutes? Okay. <laughs> no, no. I think it will, it will go. It will go. Thank you very much for. Uh,
this. So another uh, component of productive part is to, um, to uh, understand uh, the differentiation between, between simple location uh, and uh, anchoring activities. Simple location is, uh, I think, very clear. Uh, what does uh, a firm need? Uh, a firm needs land, building, infrastructure, grand equivalents maybe, and things like that. But do you think that if you gather all that, if you have land, building, infrastructure, grand equivalents and subsidies and so on, are you sure that this firm will forever locate in the place it is? The answer is quite clear. The answer is no. So you have location, delocation, relocation, and so on. The, the idea here, the topic, is to try to anchor activities in a territory. Anchor and not just locate. And you know, the way to do that is to develop a triple proximity, special, based on competencies and based on trust and confidence. This is extremely important. Uh, a lot of articles have been written on this extremely important point. Perhaps I will go back uh, on this point if we have uh, uh, some minutes afterwards. Uh, sixth point, I think it's rather clear. Uh, in order to do that, we cannot forget uh, that the countries are today open. The idea is not to close them, I, I'm not uh, in, this, uh, in this way, eh? but the idea is to have a sort of an openness, but uh, taking in account social norms, economic norms, and even financial norms, without forgetting, of course, uh, norms uh, uh, related to nature and to uh, environment. We absolutely need the standards, uh, to uh, have this new development of productive uh, activities. Um, I'm finishing. Huh? Uh, the idea uh, is, uh, in my opinion, that industry uh, should be seen as a common good. Uh, it should not be seen only as a private good or a public good, nationalized uh, good uh, by the state when the things go worst. The idea is really to understand that industry is a common good uh, belonging to the whole country. Uh, if France has developed uh, a strong uh, uh, aeronautic uh, sectors, uh, it used not only uh, to uh, some uh, engineers on firms, it's a, it's a uh, all French people, uh, the French nation has built this uh, industry to take an example. The idea. So, and to end perhaps, the idea, uh, this is uh, the last idea, perhaps, and I will finish, that economic policies should be based on this uh, model and uh, they should focus on long time. And these uh, uh, policies have to address the very important question, in my opinion, what is a development and not what is growth. And here is, in my opinion, a very uh, important distinction. Uh, perhaps I'll come back another, <laughs> another time to, in order to discuss this point. I think we confuse absolutely growth uh, and development. Uh, what we need today is not one point more or two points more or even three points more of GDP. Of course, it will be better if we, we, we had them, but the problem is not that. The, the problem is more, more, more deeper than that. What we need is, in my opinion, a new uh, development model. And my main proposal is to say that in the heart of uh, this new productive model, we need new productive uh, activities and new industry. Thank you very much. I hope it was. Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, <laughs> all the powerful presentation. And um, uh, me, I'm Maria Matalla. I'm from uh, Option C, that's Development Path, and Emmanuel from uh, Option A, it's more innovation and knowledge economics. Um, uh, I'm from Egypt. Emmanuel is from Nigeria. <laughs> Uh, we enjoyed also reading the paper, so thank you. And well, um, 
to give a quick uh, pr uh, overview of what we are going to present, which we will try to keep very short as possible, uh, it's a quick recap of uh, what the professor has said and what we have read in the paper. It's actually um, the seven components of the production um, pack. Uh, the second we will be, Manuel will be presenting the status quo of the industrialization, the current situation of industry in uh, European Union. And for us to be a bit of more value added, we, f we choose to focus on the labor issues. And we have two uh, basic perspectives. We'll talk about the labor rights and also the innovation as a potential for growing uh, industry. Uh, lastly, but not least, we will be uh, just posing two questions. Perhaps one of them is already answered, but anyway. <laughs> so, uh, the professor has already talked about the usefulness of having and the urgency for having a European industrial policy, which is uh, stemming from uh, the fact that Europe is facing deindustrialization. Emmanuel is going to be presenting some um, uh, facts about uh, the trends of industry in Europe. Uh, well, basically, there are two possible directions for uh, the European industrial devel uh, development. Uh, first, it needs to take advantage of the complementarities and, uh, and uh, the potentials of all uh, the member countries but it also needs to be framed in a coherent way, uh, especially with uh, the macroeconomic situation in the European Union. Um, next is the seven pillars that the professor has already uh, presented very quickly. Uh, we need to consider industry as a system. It needs to consider all the individuals, all the actors, and not just specific or the big firms or the actors. Um, the next two is building worker skills, but also having a democratic workplace. Um, this will be tackling a bit uh, more, um, and also a hint about the definancialization, uh, which is basically bringing back the role of uh, finance um, to its uh, to its original job, is serving the the real sector rather than the opposite case. Um, we need also to focus on the ecology, on the nature, and um, this is mutual between the firm and the nature. So how the firm is uh, gaining its value from the nature around it, but also how uh, the firm is affecting, whether positively or negatively, the nature. Um, also protectionism, the professor, you, you have already talked about this. Perhaps also... Um, yeah, did you, did you notice that these are six, not seven? <laughs> but basically ecology has the two direction, the two way uh, relationship between nature and the firm. So Emmanuel is gonna be presenting the status quo. Uh, I'll be um, showing uh, evidence of what the... Speak up, I'll be showing the uh, evidence of what the uh, professor has stressed because uh, there's a change in the uh, there's emergence of uh, new um, industrial power like China, so there's a change in the, um, in, in trade uh, in in uh, capital flows. So this has redirect uh, the uh, global value chains, and in Europe we can see it's all decreasing. This is uh, 2000 and this is uh, 2014. Then. Uh, these are the uh, the countries, so we can see that the uh, value added on the aggregate level in Europe is quite uh, decreasing. Then the employment structure is due to uh, uh, digi digitalization of the uh, increase in the digitalization of the industrial activities in Europe. And also, as a function of uh, the uh, global crisis, and we can see that as employment is growing down across the year, we have increased in value added on the aggregate level. Uh, then the, the evolution of uh, investment, because of the uh, constant bank uh, deleverages and the uh, standardized uh, bank credit. Uh, investment has has not been quite available for uh, productive uh, activities, and we can see 
uh, from 2000 to 2014, investment in buildings and in uh, manufacturing has been uh, decreasing on the aggregate level. Then the availability of bank loans for uh, financial uh, activities has also decreased at, uh, as well on the aggregate level. And it was talking about price. So we, we proceed uh, price with the energy price. You can see in, the, in 2012 recently, it's very low compared to uh, 2007. So it shows how, uh, and uh, we also captured the, the small uh, contribution of uh, SME. So we proceed the uh, SME with, with, with uh, value added. Then you can see the, you can see Greece and, and Germany, like uh, he pointed out, uh, Greece, although they don't uh, depend on export, and at the same time they are not uh, uh, redirect to the to the real value added of of exports. So we see the load, uh, the total labor cost and the productivity is not quite uh, on the same vein because we have more more cost compared to the. So give. Thank you. Um, well, I think um, if if we chose to talk basically about the labor because we think that, as the professor mentioned, it's uh, seen as a cost. But because it's seen as a cost, labor is probably paying the whole cost for the in for the industrialization. And if you want to talk about labor in a more macroeconomic view. We can, we, we, mm, I, th I think 60% at least of people sitting here know what it means that um, the, the European, con uh, the European uh, Union countries, but also the European Union as a whole, are wage-led regimes. It basically says what these two graphs are showing. It basically says that, um, well, the wage share since the 1960s have been declining, but also at the same time growth has been declining. At the same time, because of the wage share is, is declining, the unemployment has been on the rise, which, which suggests also the opposite. Perhaps if we, rise, if we raise the wage share, then we will be able to increase growth and to increase um, employment. Um, this is basically very important because uh, since the financial crisis, uh, many countries have been uh, forced to decrease their minimum wages and uh, through the Troika and other uh, other uh, regulations, and uh, it has, I think, it has worsened the financial crisis in Europe. Uh, this is regarding the wage. The other point is regarding the quality of the job and feeling secure in our jobs. And I think also this is a bit related to what the professor has mentioned about how we see the firm. How we see um, how how we translate the firm in our laws and uh, and uh, um, legislation, because when it is seen just as um, um, uh, kind of assets versus uh, liabilities, then we are basically showing the rights of shareholders, and we we are probably totally neglecting the uh, um, the rights of the labor. Um, this is actually one of the um, one of the studies uh, in France that is showing the relationship between being employed in a family firm co uh, compared to the publicly listed firms or the public firms uh, where basically ownership is open um, for different shareholders. It's basically showing that family firms tend to pay less. However, family firms are characterized by lower job insecurity. The actually, um, so the, the lower dismissal rates, which means that um, we have higher job security. And this is perhaps puts also some scope for the fin financialization process. How uh, the more dispersed and the more uh, volatile uh, the money becomes, the, the also the, uh, the, the more volatile the, um, the status of labor becomes. This is the second point. Emmanuel will be talking about the uh, potential of innovation for uh, labor in the industrial policy. Okay, uh, all has been said, and from all uh, indication, it is very, very, uh, it's evident that uh, FEMS uh, 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 organization 
innovation is very, very uh, important. And coming from the uh, um, the theories of uh, organization theory, we have the, uh, the Taylor's uh, theory, we have the, uh, the fire theory. The best theory uh, Europe could adopt could uh, would be the uh, system theory approach. Like like he said, firms are uh, their bonding of uh, inter interconnected uh, and, and subsections, and uh, they are mutually dependent. So the component of system theory could be uh, individual behavior, role of firms, role of employees, role of the board of directors, role of the shareholders, role of the enterprise is clearly descent. Then the linking process is the communication between all the subsystems. Then in this aspect, we also have the uh, decision making, how decisions and the balancing. Then we have the uh, organization goals. It's very uh, important to note that the goals of the enterprise and of the shareholders might be different, but the balancing yeah, in the linking process, make uh, do for this. Then the uh, system theory cannot uh, function very well, except or unless uh, interacting with the uh, sociological, sociotechnological approach, because in this, this transform uh, the technology in the hands has been manipulat manipulated by the uh, system theory into uh, <coughs> a very productive unit. Then, yeah, we have every organization consists of the people, the technical system, and the environment. Like you said, anchoring. Uh, this is the, uh, the, the anchoring, anchoring aspect. So in this, the tools, techniques, and knowledge are used to produce goods or services valued by customers. Uh, then, so this approach, the, uh, the combination of the system approach and the uh, and social technological approach leads to divining uh, industry as a common good because here yeah, industry uh, they evolve into a complex institution because of the uh, multiplicity of purposes because of the substance and the subsystems and how the subsystems interact together. So there is uh, complexity. There is a degree of uh, interdependencies of subsystems, uh, there's openness, there's balance, then the uh, resultant and the uh, cumulative effect is the uh, multiplicity of functions because that is where the tacit knowledge lies, that is where we uh, recognize the uh, contribution of employees, that is where the goal of the industry, the goal of the uh, enterprise and the goal of the shareholder and the goal of the society are all harmonized. So in conclusion, we um, Firms have to innovate and uh, recognize the employees' skills, but not to see them as uh, as labor cost. So, pass. Lastly, uh, we would like to just have two questions. Perhaps you have already tackled the first, which is regarding um, the feasibility of recognizing the firm as. Uh, uh, as a large entity with uh, workers as a stakeholder, but also with other perhaps different stakeholders, the nature is one of them. Um, how feasible can this be? And the other is a bit more broad. And okay, we now know that it is the, the going back to the industrialization and putting a new industrial policy that should be effective, inclusive, coherent, and so on between the 28 European countries. This is probably a long <laughs> process and uh, it entails the reformation of legal and economic infrastructure of the European Union um, and politically it might be unlikely, I don't know. <laughs> but would it be easier for, if so, if that's the case, would it be easier for individual countries to decide um, uh, to go out and then uh, reform their own industrial policies, perhaps this is less costly and uh, easier politically. Um, yeah, um, thank you. <laughs> so this is the end of our presentation. Um, perhaps we can have like um, 10 minutes uh, comment from you and then we will have more questions from others. Thank you.
Ich habe schon das so, so ist wie Kern. Okay, so thank you really very much. I think you understood a lot of things uh, and uh, I appreciate really uh, very much your, your presentations. The, the way you, do it, you did that it was really perfect. The three approaches so is a, a great plus for me. Uh, thank you really very, very much. Uh, before trying to answer your questions, uh, I would like to be uh, more precise on um, two or three points, and then I will go to, to, you, to your both questions. Huh? Um, first, you said uh, Troika. Uh, everyone knows what is Troika. It's the European Commission, uh, Central Bank, <coughs> uh, EMF. Well, um, law is trying to lower minimum wages uh, in many countries, for example, uh, for example, um <laughs> uh, for example, Greece. Yeah? And uh, they pretend it works. This is uh, the point. They pretend it works. They pretend that their policy uh, brings today uh, very clear uh, results, and these results are, are positive. Uh, by lowering minimum wages, uh, they see that the external deficit, uh, trade deficit of Greece uh, is becoming uh, smaller and even a small excedent. So they say, well, if you see, oh, well, it works. It works. Price, com price, uh, price competitiveness is better uh, through uh, lower costs. This is absolutely manipulation. This is a perverse manipulation. Because the real uh, situation is that by lowering, lowering minimum wages, the consumption is, of course, getting back. It's clear. People have no money to consume. Through lower consumption, the imports get back dramatically, 40% lower. Okay? And if you just let the exportations as they are, as they are then, of course, instead of having a deficit, you have a surplus. Okay? It doesn't mean anything. It just means that uh, the, the, the people uh, are getting more and more poor. Uh, the country is not developing at all, just on the contrary. Okay? And then uh, you can, of course, of course not expect uh, any positive effects. And the people who do understand that very well are young people, qualified people, getting a weight out of Greece because they know, uh, unfortunately for them, there is no future in a country without, uh, without development. So this is the first point. I've, explaining, I've explained that in, in two articles uh, I could send you if you want. Second point, very short. You straight. You, uh, you emphasize there is a link between uh, financialization or definancialization and the way to think what is labor. This is a very complex problem eh, in, in, really, in reality. But in try, I will try to, to, to resume the problem. The problem is the problem in reality of what is globalization. And globalization is not internationalization. These both processes are quite different. Internationalization means that a country opens itself. It means more imports, more exports. Okay? This is absolutely not new. This is a process uh, uh, you can observe 30 years, 40 years, even centuries. If you, t if you look now, what is globalization? It doesn't mean that we still remain in an... In an Ricardian world, the world of Ricardo. By Ricardo, what is moving? What is moving are goods and services. But the production factors are immobile. They do not move. It's very important. What is moving is just goods and services. Labor doesn't move by Ricardo. Capital doesn't move. This is extremely important. In the world today, what is moving at most? Products, services, or production factors? Production factors are moving. 
most. This is uh, the very important. We do not live truly in a Ricardian world. This is exactly the opposite. What does it mean exactly? It means that we have, we have in reality, four factors and not two factors. The four factors are financial capital, financial capital, productive capital, the nature of both are completely different. Financial capital is, okay, I take money, I take uh, uh, shares, I, I buy b dollars, I, say, uh, I sell uh, yuan and yen, uh, uh, derivates, uh, things like that. This is, this is uh, financial capital. Productive capital, these are international investments. I open a new plant. This is not financial capital, this is productive capital. So we have two sorts of capital. As well, we have two sorts of labor. High skill cognitive labor, and these people are mobile, are more and more mobile. And people who are probably less qualified, or at least their qualifications, their competencies are not looked for. No one has an interest for these sorts of uh, competencies. And if you look, these four forms, these four uh, production forms, uh, production factor forms, they are different, the nature is not the same, and they have not the same speed of mobility. This is extremely important. The financial capital is volatile. It moves within the second. If you take the investment capital, the productive capital, or qualified workers, they move, but of course they are not volatile. They cannot move as uh, financial capital. It means they need two years, three years, or something like that to move. If you want to move as a, a qualified <coughs> person, you will prepare your project. When you are there, you will think, how should I go back, and so on. You need time. You need two years, three years, I don't know exactly. It's exactly the same for uh, foreign investments. Okay? They are mobile, but not volatile as financial capital. And Last is not qualified or not recognized competencies of some people working. And these people, they were before the mobile factor. Today, the governments say, just stay where you are. Don't move. We are going to move the productive capital. You understand what I say? We delocalate and relocate the firms, the plants, if you, pre if you prefer. So we have... We have not two, but four production factors. These factors are very inequally mobile. You do get what, what I mean? Okay. And my main uh, assumption is that the revenue of the factors are today absolutely linked with their mobility. It means the most mobile factor will get as first its revenue, and once this factor has been remunerated, then the second one, the third one, and then the last one. Do you understand what I, what I mean? Okay. Clearly, it means that the financial capital takes the money and run, as the proverb says. Okay. And then the investment, uh, the normal economic investment, and the people having, I would say, a rather good competencies, uh, informaticians, researchers, uh, engineers, uh, and so on. And when all these factors have been remunerated, then you have the last uh, factor, and the last gets what remains, what we call in mathematics residue. It's a residue, what is left when the, all the other have taken uh, their revenue. Do you understand that? It means that the globalization is intrinsically uh, unfair. The, the, it's not, uh, the inequalities are not a, a just a problem, it's not just a problem we have to solve uh, within the globalization. The inequalities are at the heart of the globalization. If we agree uh, that the four factors are inequally mobile and that the revenues of the factors are linked to the mobility, then the globalization cannot be else than unequal. Do you understand what I mean? So the question I have is, how do we fight against that? 
And the only answer logically, at, uh, at least for me, eh, and I think politically too, is to try to take, and then I will make the link you are looking for, to take both factors which are extreme, the extreme mobile and the extreme unmobile, and try to put them in a moyenne, uh, uh, middle average, or something like average, that. Yes. Huh? Average, yeah. It means you have to slower the volatility, the mobility of financial capital, and you have to have a higher mobi mobility by the labor force. How do you do that by the financial capital? It is by bringing temporal retardants. It means, for example, the taxes pays, the tax should not be the same if you distribute the profits to the shareholders or reinvest them in the firm. Do you understand? Uh, another example, the Tobin tax. It's exactly that. It's exactly what I mean. But I put the Tobin tax in a general system and not isolate the, the, mob, the Tobin tax. And by the uh, fourth uh, uh, factor, I mean the the labor force, you have to have a very strong educa education investment, professional training investment, so that the, these people are more mobile. And when I say more mobile, it doesn't mean necessarily special mobility. They may stay at home. This is the real mobili mobility. Is I decide to stay where I am, but I'm able today to work on this project and tomorrow on another project. It is a professional mobility and not a special mobility. You understand the, the difference is very, <coughs> very important. So if you do that, then you link definitionalization uh, and another way to, to think uh, the labor force by, uh, by getting higher uh, competencies. Third point, and then I go to the <laughs> question. Anchoring and not location. Uh, anchoring extremely, is ex extremely important. How uh, is it possible to anchor activities in territories? Not by infrastructures, by uh, high-speed uh, debit, uh, by, um, uh, I don't know, land or infrastructures or things like that. These are, these are uh, preliminary conditions. You need them. If you don't have them, of course, no, no single firm will invest or implant itself. It has, has no sense. But it doesn't mean anchoring. How do you get this, uh, this uh, very extreme pouring ac and coring activities in a mobile world? The only way, in my opinion, at least again logically, I, I try to be just logical, is just by recognizing that the firms today do not have anymore within themselves all competencies they need to produce complex goods or complex services. If you take an example where I live, I live in Toulouse. In Toulouse, we have uh, the headquarters of our Airbus industry. In my laboratory, we have uh, worked, we have uh, written a lot of things about uh, aeronautics, Airbus and so on. As you can guess, we are an industrial laboratory. It's uh, quite, quite normal. And we have tried to, to understand what are the, the possibilities to anchor uh, this firm to avoid that uh, tomorrow uh, uh, Airbus leaves uh, Toulouse, leaves uh, even France or Europe and uh, shift to, to, to uh, Asia or China or uh, elsewhere. And the answer is absolutely clear. Today, uh, this is an Airbus. Do you know what is the share of this product uh, conceived and produced within the firm? 20%. 80% are externalized, okay? Airbus externalizes almost everything. They just keep inside the conception of the plane and the assembly, okay? They take parts of everywhere. All the parts, the engines, the wings, the fuselage, uh, all parts uh, are, have been externalized. It is extremely important. If you take uh, the uh, territory of Toulouse and have uh, an, an, uh, an anal analysis, an industrial analysis of this territory, then you will see that there are a lot of networks, organized networks, organized competencies, and we have in this uh, territory a firm able to say, 
I am able to produce this system, this subsystem. I'm able to produce this subsystem. I'm able to produce this subsystem. So that Airbus finds in Toulouse area, Toulouse territory, all competencies which the firm needs in order to be able to conceive and produce an airplane. Did you understand that? It's extremely important. This is anchoring the, 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 the activities. And, uh, and we have, uh, uh, we have um, uh, advised the General Council of, uh, of Occitanie not to, to, to further uh, subsidize, uh, subsidize uh, Airbus. It, is, it had no sense. It's just organize the subcontractors, organize the networks in order that the territory is able to give a coordinated answer to the needs of the firms, of the firm. Do you understand what, what I tried to say? If it's not clear, I will send you some articles that have been written in English about that. Well, two points. The feasibility uh, of defining the firm as an institution. This is a right problem, a right problem. It is written in the right. What is written in the right about the firm? Nothing, nothing, it's a whole. There is nothing. If you look, le droit de l'entreprise, the right of the enterprise in the French uh, civil system, you will find nothing. It doesn't exist at all. So, so the tool is to define it. To define it by saying, first article, the enterprise as such exists and should not be confused with the society. Second point, the aim of the society is to serve the shareholders. The aim of the enterprise is to serve the stakeholders and not the shareholders. Third point, the aim of the firm is to produce goods and services responding to the demand or to the needs, and so on and so on. This law has to be written. It's not a, a right problem, it is a political problem. It is a political problem. What does it mean? It means that the citizens the syndicates have to understand that this topic is an extremely important topic. Instead, trying uh, to avoid, um, comment dit, licenciement? Uh, uh, firing. Firing people by developing. Comment tu dis? Layouts. Lay layout, ça. Lay lay before. Uh, inst uh, okay. <laughs> instead, to, instead to avoiding. Uh, uh, such a, such a measures, which are of course regressive, it would be much intelli more intelligent to say uh, citizens uh, gather themselves and they uh, want, they, 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 they organize themselves in order uh, to push the parliament to vote uh, a new article, uh, which today doesn't exist. This article says that the firm as an entity exists. Okay, this is an extremely important uh, uh, point, and if you read French, uh, uh, I don't know if some, some of you read uh, French, next March uh, th there is an, an important uh, publication in French, uh, unfortunately, but we're in France, huh? I would name uh, Les Cahiers Français, and in the next publication of March I've written an article uh, exactly on this uh, point. Uh, so if you are interested, I will send it after, after March uh, <laughs> when it's been published. So it's a political problem, really. Uh, uh, the last point. Um, um, well, yeah, Europe, Europe is, is uh, as it is, uh, is very constraining. Uh, and of course, the temptation to say we have to find a uh, because there is no other solution. A national way is, is of course, uh, um, the, the question is of course very, uh, very pertinent. I understand the question. Huh? Uh, what, what are the problems? Uh, the problems are uh, a lot. Uh, one problem is of course an ideological problem. Uh, the European Commission is a liberal uh, commission, much more oriented to the market than it is uh, oriented uh, to the by industrial dynamics. Uh, this is very clear, uh, and uh, I, cou I could uh, develop this, this point. This is an ideological choice, and you can fight against this uh, ideological choice. But I think, as far as I am an economist and not a politist, that there is an, uh, an economic problem. The economic problem is if you consider 
the national uh, specializations in Europe, they are not complementary. And this is a, a very big problem. What does it mean? They are not complementary. It means that we have in Europe one very large country which is not complementary with the other ones. This country has for name Germany. Germany is not at all a Ricardian country. What does it mean? I was talking about uh, Ricardo just before. It means uh, that normally by Ricardo, a firm has, um, a country has to specialize. You know that. The Germans do exactly the contrary. They do not specialize. Or to be more precise, they specialize as the Japans by exportations. It means if you take five products, you will have 80% by five products of German exportations. But if you take the importations, the, importation, the German importations are not specialized at all. It means that the Germans import a little bit of everything. So it's an uh, asymmetric specialization, a uh, strong specialization ex exports, but no specialization by imports. Do you understand what I mean? OK? So it means that when we try, for example, in France, to export some products towards Germany, it's impossible, or almost impossible, because they do produce what they need. I'll take an example, agriculture or textile closes. The question is, is it a specialization for Germany? The answer is no, it's not a specialization. They are not very strong ex uh, by, by exports. But what we see is that within the last 20 years, they reduce their importations. They reduce their importations by developing their own production to respond their demand. So, on one hand, the exports are very concentrated. On the other hand, they refuse to import and develop their own production to respond to their own demand. So, here we have to deal with a country which, which doesn't play at all uh, um, the specialization and complementarities with other countries. Okay? The only way to integrate by, I mean, industrial integration, uh, Europe would be to exclude Germany. <laughs> if, if we would, I think it would be difficult. If we would exclude Germany, then it would be, it would be perhaps possible to play on the complementarities between France, uh, Spain, Italy, uh, and uh, other countries. But with Germany inside, refusing any form of specialization by importation, it's impossible. And of course, they have uh, an, an surplus uh, each year, which is growing because they grow uh, the exportations and simultaneously <laughs> reduce the importations. If you reduce the importations <laughs> and push your exportations, of course, well, you have every year a higher uh, surplus. So by ideolog for ideological reasons and to economic reasons, the European uh, way is uh, very complicated, and I think, of course, uh, the, the, the final answer, final answer is that uh, uh, there are a lot of things to do by national level. That's for sure. I agree with that. Okay, was not two minutes. Thank you. No, no, not twenty minutes. In ten minutes, around ten. ten, minutes. ten uh, so let's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Maria Mohammed. I am from Pakistan. Yep. I just wanted to ask you in your presentation, you talked about industry as a common good, and how can we like put this idea forward in this uh, regime of uh, capitalism when even small industries or entrepreneurs even move towards this idea of um, uh, uh, profit maximization and a probability and knowledge creation in this issue uh, is a big thing, and you cannot 
to work with this when you deal in industry as a common good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hi, Gabriel. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It was, mm -hmm. was really interesting. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the, the American uh, car manufacturing industry moving to Mexico. Yeah. And in order to counteract a um, higher degree of cooperation in your industrial base and a more densified um, yeah. sector. But I just, within the current um, corporate structure where finance is the, plays a central role yeah. and you see uh, foreign subsidies and, and cheap labor, I, I, I find hard to find something for the short run that can reach this, this desired level of cooperation and, and growth for the domestic industrial base to develop itself. So yeah. I don't know if you could elaborate a little bit more. Yeah. Hi, my name is Victoria. I'm from Austria. Um, just a really, really quick question. You praised Germany a lot in your presentation. Um, and one of the reasons why Germany is able to do all of the things you praised it for is that it's doing wage dumping, right? So my question is, is that it's doing wage dumping? So my question is, how should other European countries go in a similar direction without doing that? Thank uh -huh. you. Okay, I'll try to, to, to answer these three questions. And if we have now another five minutes, uh, I'll take other ones if you want. Um, of course, you, you cannot pretend that industry uh, has to develop as a common good just by keeping as only uh, indicator or goal profit maximization. It doesn't fit together at all. Uh, it doesn't mean, in my opinion, that profit is not necessary because you need, uh, in any way, you need profit because without any profit, uh, you are not able to self-finance your investments. So the, in this case, uh, the, the firm would be dependent of the banks or the financial markets, so you, you, you don't solve the problem. But of course, uh, the, the idea uh, is if you want to see the industry and the firm as a common good, common good you have to define goals which are much broader uh, than uh, profit maximization. And even by profit, the question is, how do you deal with the profit? What do you do with them? Do you distribute them uh, mainly or by 100% to the shareholders or do you need them uh, to re reinvest in the firm? Okay, but it's not enough. Uh, then you, you have to have other indicators and one important indicator in my opinion is uh, are the goods and services produced by the firm responding to the, uh, to the basic needs of the population or not? Is the burden of the productive activity uh, uh, related to the nature, is it um, decreasing or not? So you have to, to build a whole a set uh, of goals, uh, economic, uh, social, environmental, and why not political, uh, cultural. I've written uh, things about that, if you want. Uh, I will send you, uh, but it's in French, uh, uh, this, uh, this article. So this is the main point. The common good is not uh, possible with only one indicator, uh, profit maximization. In the short run, uh, nothing is possible. <laughs> okay, nothing is possible in the short run. Uh, the industrial decline is a result of uh, uh, 20 years, uh, 30 years uh, away, which is completely wrong, uh, bringing uh, developed countries uh, in a, in, a, um, uh, in a very bad situation as today. So there is no, uh, uh, how should I say, uh, one solution or a couple of solutions uh, able to, to, uh, to, to get out of the mess uh, within six months or one year. It's a very long process, but the idea is knowing that the process is very long, we have urgently to engage it and to engage it by the good way and not uh, to say, as it said, oh yes, we need industry and the only way to, need it to have a good and strong industry is to reduce labor costs, as it is very often said, because you recognize the priority, but the question how, <laughs> the answer is completely wrong. And here I disagree absolutely uh, with uh, your proposal, absolutely. Uh, the, uh, if uh, the German uh, industrial uh, situation 
is today a rather good one. It has no uh, link at all with uh, uh, dumping uh, in, uh, um, by, by wages, not at all. Uh, the, the idea uh, that uh, the Schroeder reforms uh, are explaining the performance uh, of uh, uh, the industry mm. of Germany, this idea is very broad, uh, diffuse, but is completely wrong. Uh, the, the, the situation, uh, the industrial uh, performance of Germany has not, is not um, um, uh, price competitiveness uh, driven, because if you say, if you say um, it is the wage uh, dumping which explains uh, the situation today of the German industry, it would mean that you have reduced the cost and uh, the competitiveness uh, gets, uh, is, is higher. It's not the case at all. The, the competitiveness of the German industry is not at all a price competitiveness. The only question is, According to the fact that uh, the competitiveness of the German industry is a global competitiveness based on innovation, how do we explain the pressure on, on the wages? And the answer is here, not competitiveness, not. The answer is that as uh, all, the, all other countries, the um, um, exigence, how do you say? The demands of the shareholders in Germany are today much higher than they were for 10 years or 15 years. And the pressure on the wages is not to be explained by price competitiveness, but by actionaires, shareholders, who say, here, bring the money. So if you see the cost, they do uh, have uh, fall. There's no, no doubt about that, but if you see, by the statistic, what, what, uh, what is the translation of uh, uh, lower cost? Does it mean a higher competitiveness by reducing uh, the prices? The answer is no. The answer is that the, the reducing of labor cost has expanded the profits and the dividends served to the shareholder. It's not at all a question of competitiveness, it's a question of rentability. And this is a very broad confusion between competitiveness and rentability. The firms in, in Germany, as everywhere in the world, are put under pressure by financial markets to have a higher rentability, higher returns, to serve higher dividends. But this is an aim, this is a topic, this topic has nothing to do with competitiveness. Yeah. Uh, do we still have five? Yeah. Right. Okay, one very small cut. Yeah. Who produces that? I'm Carmen from Option B, also from? Marco. Carmen, Option B, Germany. Okay. Uh, talking Germany, uh, exactly. Uh, uh, thank you for making this point. Also, um, I wanted to ask and add that uh, in Germany um, usually the trade unions of the external sector, of the export sector is the strongest, like the IG Metall yeah. has a very strong stake yeah. and it was also due to them, it was a sort of strategic um, yeah. turn of the IG Metall to say we uh, accept a wage not even cuts, but maybe stagnation right. um, in, 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 in exchange for job security. Right. What, is your, um, what is your idea of such a strategy of a trade union? It's a compromise. It's really a compromise. And the compromise is not an Israel compromise. It's a financial compromise because the syndicates in Germany, IG Metall, uh, they have very well understood that the German industry is today put under pressure by financial markets. They know that very well. So they accept that uh, the German firms do have to produce a higher rentability. Okay? But the question is, rentability and competitiveness, are they in opposite? Or is it possible to combine them? Till today, till today they have been in Germany combined. It means German firms remain competitive. It means they invest in Germany. They invest in uh, Ausbildung, uh, how do you say that? Formation. Yeah, formation, yeah. Things, things like that. Uh, I speak better German than better English, okay? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, on the same time, uh, they are rentable and serve higher dividends to the shareholders. 
Is it possible for Germany to keep this path uh, another 10 years? I think no. The, the answer is no. Uh, and uh, you, you, <coughs> may, you may know that uh, very big firms, uh, for example, G uh, Siemens, uh, today have uh, decided to uh, on dit, dit, licencier, lay, lay off? Mm -hmm. to lay off uh, uh, 2,800 uh, IG Metal uh, is not at all satisfied with that and they begin to say that they, they don't follow the, 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 the agreement and so on and so on. So I think that uh, the, the, op the opposition between rentability and competitiveness uh, which is to be seen in, any, in, in every country uh, in France, uh, America, and so on, will be seen in the next months uh, in, in Germany, that's for sure. But I have written uh, an article about that exactly in Le Monde. Uh, in French, I can send it to you if you want to. I think, uh, Danny, I, <laughs> 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 I would like to take my plane back. <laughs> <laughs>